أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So violence in the Sharia and uh, the reason I, I want to speak about this is because it's always an uh, important topic but it's brought up over and over again uh, in the news and it's something from which Muslims suffer and it's something from which Muslims suffer not in the sense that I want to focus on the problems that Muslims have but it's a it's a way in which Muslims are victimized in which Muslims are victimized by others and in turn in which Muslims are unable to fulfill their duty to their larger community in which they live in the United States, in Western Europe, or anywhere. And I think hopefully by the end of my lecture, inshallah, you'll understand why I introduce it as such. What time should I shut up by, by the way? Is that clock right? Yeah, 8, um, 8.30. 8.30, okay. Very efficient. Someone said 8 o'clock? Yeah. It is 8 o'clock. You want me to go back in time and shut up? <laughs> Do my best. Okay. The, I want, first I want to, to um, I also, I, I think I've done a scan of the audience and I think that there's no one so young who can't hear the things I'm going to say. Uh, the things I'm going to say are not, I, I don't think that they're, they're inappropriate, but you know, they are serious issues. So I didn't want to have you know, 50 kindergarten kids in the front row or something. But I, you know, Muslims are serious people, by the way. Muslims are serious people. Their scholars are serious people. There's nothing that they're not willing to talk about. There's no problem they're not willing to consider. And uh, I think that we should be a, a bit more uh, open in the things we discuss as a community. It might allow us to resolve our own problems more efficiently. What I want to talk about is honor killing. It's a controversial issue. But I'm going to make a contention. I'm going to say not only is honor killing un-Islamic, I'm going to say that contrary to what you hear on the news, it's not caused by Islam. It's not a problem that's particularly common to Muslims. And actually that I believe that Islam as a religion and the Sharia as a system of values and rules offers the answer to this. It's not a cause of the problem. It's the answer for the, to the problem. I feel very strongly and I'm convinced of that. Maybe you'll be convinced as well. Or you already are. And I'm just preaching to the choir. The, I was very shocked. I found something, there's a fascinating case, in a legal case in 1947 in northern Nigeria, amongst the Muslims of northern Nigeria. There was a, the local courts, even though it was a British colony, the local courts were Sharia courts in the north. Precisely the place where Boko Haram is active today, we hear about it in the news every day. Uh, the Sharia court came out with a verdict. It sentenced a man to death. And the British court was staffed by British judges, the appeals court that looked at any serious sentence. They, uh, the British court overturned this sentence. It considered it to be too harsh a sentence. And we hear this a lot. The Sharia law is very harsh. You know, it's, it's cruel. We hear this in the news. The British uh, judge overturned this. Now, what's interesting is that the man had killed his wife's lover. The Sharia court had sentenced him to death. Death for murder. The ju British judges said no. This was a crime of passion. It was a crime of passion and he cannot be punished seriously. This is the opposite of what you'd re you would expect to happen if you watched the news and thought about Muslims and Islam, what the media wants you to think and what they often, how they portray the religion. But this is actually much more representative of the Islamic tradition than what you would come across in the media. The in, in UN reports, UN human rights, rights reports, the last one was in, in 2012, they suggest that there's about, about 5,000 honor killings a year. About 5,000 honor killings a year. R roughly 1,000 are in Pakistan, but roughly 1,000 are in India. An honor killing is 
when a, man, a husband or a mother or a father, somebody kills a wife or a daughter because of a perceived uh, infringement on what's considered honorable conduct. Now, that is a statistic you, you might come across, and with the amount of things you see in the news, it's not surprising. We hear constantly about the problems of honor killing. However, this is just one type of violence against women. It's only one type of violence against women. And the UN prefers to speak not about honor killing, but about something called femicide. Femicide is killing a woman because she's a woman, for some reason. And what you see is in different parts of the world, there are different ways in which this is phrased. So for example, in Southeast Asia and in Southern Africa, every year, according to the UN, hundreds of women are killed a year because they're accused of being sorceresses, of using black magic. In uh, place in uh, the, the part of the world where there's the highest percentage of violence against women and the largest number of violence against women, femicide, Anyone want to guess where this is? The, the part of the world with the most violence against women per year. Hmm? How did you know that? El Salvador. Someone's read, someone actually reads a newspaper. What's your name? Tahir Aziz. Tahir Aziz? Tahir Aziz, you're an educated person. What can I say? Uh, I'll just leave and you can give the lecture. So, El Salvador. Actually, Latin America is the part of the world with the most violence against women. Um, and they're not Muslims there, by the way. Very few Muslims. So these, uh, you find it in uh, South America, Central America, places like Italy. Places, and this is not my term, this is a term used by scholars, with a lot of machismo in the culture. A lot of machismo in the culture. Where is one of the most concentrated areas of violence against women. It does, you, this audience might know about it. I did not know about it until I went to this place in 2012 and heard about it for the first time. I am a, I'm an educated guy, okay? I have a PhD, I'm no dummy. I've been around the block, right? I read from time to time. And I had never heard of this. Anyone here from India? A few people? Have you heard of dowry killings? Yeah. yeah, I had never heard of dowry killings until 2012. And I was reading this 2012 UN report, and it said that in 2009, there had been 8,383 dowry killings in 2009 in India alone. That's more than all the honor killings in the rest of the world. Mussolini and Hitler. Who? Mussolini and Hitler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Slightly off topic, but uh, so the, uh, actually, at that rate, it's two people, two women a day are killed in Delhi, just in Delhi. Uh, honor killing, as I learned, is an instance in which the family of a husband, usually, oftentimes the women folk in the family, uh, kill the, or participate in killing, premeditated murder of the wife because either her family has failed to deliver the promised dowry payments or it can be as simple as her not being a good enough wife. And oftentimes the woman is burned and the police don't investigate it because it is attributed to being a kitchen accident. You know, God forbid such a kitchen accident ever actually happened in, in, my, in my house. Right? I mean, there's a lot of people getting burned completely to death, thousands a year. So no one in the United States knows about this issue. Because they're so focused on writing about Muslim violence against women. No one talks about violence against women in South America. No one talks about violence against women in India. No one talks about violence against women in the United States. I want to get back to that at the end of the talk, but first, let's talk about Islam. Uh, Professor Brown, uh, uh, Sahib? Uh, 
Sahir. Tahir. Tahir Aziz here. I think she's so smart. Tahir Aziz says, Professor Brown, you can't pull the wool over my eyes because in my extensive reading, I've read the law codes of Jordan and Algeria and Morocco and Egypt and Lebanon and the UAE and Yemen and Kuwait. And they have these laws in some form or the other that say, for example, in Algeria, that if you, a man finds his wife in, let's just say, compromised situation, that if he hurts her or kills her, he receives a mitigated sentence. In places like the UAE, Yemen, Kuwait, and Oman, any female in his family that he finds in a compromised situation, he, if he harms her or kills her, he receives a highly mitigated or reduced sentence. In places like Egypt, you have similar laws. In Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Although Jordan recently amended it, so now it's gender neutral. So if a wife finds her husband in a compromised situation, at least they're trying to be fair, right? The same thing, in, as I said, in, in also in Iraq and Syria. All these countries have variations of this law. So, Tahir here, Mr. Smarty Pants, uh, likes, is going to say, well, you're telling me this is, you know, Clearly, Muslims are part of this problem. Look at all these laws. Now, I'm going to ask a question. And if Tahir knows the answer, he can't answer, OK? <laughs> Muslim countries oftentimes have at least part of their laws taken from Sharia law. So they got this, obviously, from Sharia law, because we know that Islam doesn't like women. We know Islam is violent against women, right? So they got this from Sharia law, correct? No. No. They got it from French law or British law. Maybe this audience is too smart for my lecture. Are you, is this the magical Muslim audience that's too smart for my lectures? Hopefully not. Uh, if you look at, and I actually first learned this from one of my students, because he was doing research on, he was in my class, and, and he was actually a French history major, and he'd, he came up to me and I was talking about these issues. He said, this is just like the French law of 1810, criminal law of 1810. It says that if someone finds, a man finds one of his ancestors or descendants in a, having, doing something that's disgraceful, right, and he kills that person or harms that person, that he receives a mitigated sentence, a reduced sentence. That's the French law of 1810. This was directly translated into the Ottoman Criminal Code of 1858, and then through the Ottoman Empire, influenced the Egyptian law, Lebanese law, Jordan law, Syrian law, Iraqi law, Kuwaiti law, Algerian law. In fact, if you look at Lebanon and, Jordan, uh, Lebanon and Syria and Morocco, they're really almost word-for-word -word translations from the Ottoman and then from the French. You can really see, it looks like you're looking at just a translation into Arabic from French. What about, you know, but, you know we hear about honor killings in Jordan, but where do we, we also hear about them in, in Pakistan. And the French didn't rule Pakistan. The British ruled Pakistan, correct? But the British would never give us a law like this. Actually, they also gave us this law. In the 1860 British Criminal Code that was implemented in India, British India at the time, you have a section that says that if a, if a man commits a crime because of sudden and grievous provocation, that that person in this crime of passion would receive a mitigated sentence or a reduced sentence. So this actually is directly carried into, the, the, this is the law that India and Pakistan inherit, and Bangladesh also inherit. In 1990, Pakistan passed what's called the Dia Wakisas uh, law, Dia Wakisas law, in an attempt to bring the laws in those countries, the criminal laws, closer into accordance with the Sharia, into agreement with the Sharia. 
Uh, one of the things they changed was that British law that says that if you, if a man uh, suffers a sudden and grievous provocation, the crime he commits will have a reduced sentence. They changed that because, as Pakistani jurists noted, this has no basis in the Sharia. This has no basis in the Sharia. Now, there are still honor crimes in Pakistan, and there are still people who commit these crimes who receive reduced sentences. But that's because the judges don't follow that law, unfortunately. They still make the excuse from time to time, using the exact same words that the British had given them, that these husbands had suffered sudden and grievous provocations, using still the exact same words that they received from the British. Well, I've talked about the Sharia, and I said that the Sharia doesn't have such a law in it. So what is the, what is the, what is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet say about this issue? There's actually, two, uh, the, uh, there's two hadiths to deal with this. Oh, they're in the Sahih Muslim and in Sunan Abu Dawood. And one of them, uh, it's narrated by Abu Huraira. He talks about the companion from the Khazraj, Sa'ad bin Abdullah. Sa'ad bin Abdullah, Sayyid al Khazraj. He asked the Prophet, uh, Arayta idha wajadtu ma imrati rajulan a umhilhu had to atia bi arba shuhada. What would you say if I found somebody, a man with my wife? Should I leave them be until I can bring four witnesses? I'm not going to draw this picture out for you. Everybody understands what I'm talking about. Uh, and the Prophet says, yes, that's what you should do. Because otherwise, if you were to go in and carry out justice yourself, you would be guilty of murder. You would be guilty of murder. Because the accusation that would, or the crime, that would in fact mean that these people were committing zina, you have to have either their confession or you have to have four witnesses. Four male upstand, witnesses of upstanding character. In this room, there's at most the front room. I'm just joking. Everybody, in this, everybody, all the men in this room, I'm sure, are upstanding, have upstanding character. Very hard uh, standard to meet of evidence. In another hadith, in the second hadith, uh, a man named Uwaymir, um, a companion named Uwaymir, not Ovamar Anjum, who's also coming to speak on this list, my friend Ovamar, who you should. Same name, Awamer. You should definitely listen to his lectures because he's a very smart person. I learned a lot from him. His a, a companion named Awamer asked the Prophet, Oh, uh, if I find someone with my wife, should I kill him? And then I also am killed? Because now it's been established that if you kill him, that this is murder, and you're gonna be you're gonna suffer the consequences of that. That person's family can either add have you executed, or they can request that you pay the blood price, the dia of this, of this man or this woman. And the Prophet, the answer that is given by the Prophet is the verse of Li'an, the Quranic verse of Li'an. الَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ أَزْوَاجَهُمْ وَلَمْ يَكُمْ لَهُ شُهَدَاء إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَشَهَادَةِ أَحَدَهِمْ أَرْبَعَ شَهَدَاتِمْ uh, right? Those people who accuse their spouses, their spouses, of zina, in, implied, and they only have no witnesses except for themselves. There's no other witnesses. What do they do? They have to swear four times that they are telling the truth. And then they swear a fifth time that may the, the curse of God be upon them if they're lying. Then the party they've accused, their husband or their wife, swears four times that they're telling the truth in their denial, and they swear the fifth time, may the curse of God be upon them if they're telling a lie. What happens then in Le'an? They would come to the mosque and they would do this. They would be divorced automatically. Both parties would leave the mosque, uh, no longer husband and wife. No one is punished. This is very important. Even if the husband or the wife 
catches their spouse with their eyes. They see exactly, they know what they see. There's no doubt. There's no rumor. There's no so-and-so told me. There's no I have a suspicion. There's no I saw a text message. No, you walk in and you see something. You see with the eye of yaqeen what is happening. You swear five times. If they deny it five times, you're divorced and no one suffers any punishments. That is the procedure that you follow if you, uh, if you accuse your spouse of, of infidelity or of dishonor, right? So this is the, the Sharia ruling on this. If a husband, a father uh, kills his child or a husband kills his wife, they have to face the Sharia consequences of this. Either they are required to pay the dia, or they're, uh, if the, the murder, the person who's killed, if their family f decides to forgive the person, they can be forgiven, or if the family chooses, the person is executed. And such was the insistence on this ruling that in 1529, we have a Sharia court record, in 1529, in a town in Greece, which was at that time under Ottoman rule, there was a Christian, a noble Christian family, and the husband killed the, his wife. And the wife's family brought this case to the Muslim Qadi, to the Muslim judge. And uh, the husband was required, they wanted the husband to pay the dia, the blood price of, the, of his murdered wife. So this was not only carried, uh, applied to Muslims, it was also sometimes applied to non-Muslims. Why is it important that Muslims know this about their religion? Because it's very important that Muslims not use imported laws, imported traditions to justify violence against their own community, okay? And it doesn't matter how sure you are, it doesn't matter how much you know that so-and-so is dis disgracing themselves, or how certain you are because you saw it with your own eyes. In the Sharia, you don't act by what, you don't, judgment isn't passed by what you know. It's not even passed by what the judge knows. It's passed by the procedures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in place through his revelation. Even today, and this is fascinating when you look at Muslim scholars discussing things like DNA evidence. Let's say you have DNA evidence that so-and-so's child, a woman's child, is, is not from her husband, it's a different father. Can that woman be accused of zina? Can she be convicted of zina? Can she be convicted? If she don't have four witnesses, if she doesn't confess, if you do the li'an procedure, even if you know that the child is not from the husband, the, if, if she has done the li'an procedure and sworn five times that she's innocent, she goes free. Their couple is divorced, but she goes free. These are the procedures put in place by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect Muslims, to protect them from each other's anger and each other's accusation. Um, as we were talking earlier about civil procedure. I'm learning about this uh, in the legal, American legal system too. Of course, I haven't gotten a criminal procedure class. I'm looking forward to that. So this is very important to keep in mind. Muslims need to know this about their traditions so that they can, they know what rules are put on them. They know what restrictions are put on them in their accusations. Why is this important for Muslims doing their duty to their wider communities? I'll tell you why, and this is something that I spoke to about my class this week, and I feel very strongly about it, because it's not just about violence against women. It's also about things like terrorism and, and beheading and ISIS, and how many times have you been asked in the last two weeks about ISIS and why so-and-so is beheading so-and-so a person? When people put blame on Islam and Muslims, what they're really doing is they're taking the blame off other shoulders. When people only talk about Muslims as being violent against women, what are they not talking about? They're not talking about violence against women elsewhere. They're giving themselves a free pass not to look at the way women are mistreated in their own societies. And I was just in UK about two weeks ago when I was on the tube, the subway, and I'm sitting there and the guy next to me has this huge full page, front page of the paper. It says, Muslim convert beheads granny 82 in garden. Turns out it wasn't a Muslim convert, but the point is that was the, the, the headline. Here I am, a Muslim convert, a, a little bit nervous. And then I, 
couple of days later, I saw a fascinating article in, in uh, one of the newspapers, I think it's called The Statesman in the UK. It was a woman, a British woman writing about how in her, in London in the last year, during the last year, three women had been beheaded and no one had talked about it. No one had talked about it because it wasn't a Muslim who did it, quote unquote. It wasn't a Muslim. And she said something that I found profound. She said, when Muslims do violence, people care about it because it's terrorism. But violence against women otherwise is just the background hum of our daily lives. The background hum of our daily lives. And I thought that was a very profound sentence. Because when you only care about things that Muslims do, because they're the ones who are evil, they're the ones who have all these problems, and you don't even pay attention to those very same phenomena in your own society done in right next door or down the street, you are getting a free pass not to solve your own problems, not to look to your own faults. And similarly, I can't, whenever I get asked about ISIS, I, I don't know what to say. I say, listen, are you asking me why in a country that was first subjected to 13 years of um, economic sanctions that led to the deaths of over one million children. Okay. Then it was pointlessly invaded in 2003 by the United States and Great Britain, some other countries, on premises that nobody considers valid in a war that nobody thinks was a good idea, except apparently Tony Blair still thinks it's a good idea. Nobody thinks that war is a good idea. The, the institutions of that country were completely destroyed. Law and order completely removed, right? The United States and Great Britain then completely fail to solve any of the underlying problems in that country. They leave that country in a state of chaos. Lowest count, lowest count, 170, thousand civilians die as a result of the American-led invasion. Highest reliable count by the Lancet in 2013, around 760,000 Iraqi civilians had died as a result of the invasion. Imagine, Iraq's a country, it's only about 30 million people, I think, population, it's a very small population. Imagine that, what, how many people that would be in the United States if that percentage of people died. Imagine what we would think had happened to our country. It would be unbelievable. We would be the most, and how many Americans have asked why 760,000 Iraqi civilians have died? How many people have shed tears over those people's deaths? How many people have asked about what's wrong with our politics that we do these kind of things and then don't accept accountability? Instead, when three Westerners are beheaded, and I condemn their beheading, I grieve for their families, I think it's uh, terrible, okay? But when three Westerners are petted, suddenly people start asking, what's wrong with Islam? That's, where is the logic there? That's the most illogical chain of, of thought I've ever heard in my life. For, uh, in addition, these hostages were been, had been held, some of them, for two years. And nothing had happened. They hadn't been executed. So if this is really about Islam and Muslims, why is it that somehow, oddly, they're only executed after the Americans start bombing Iraq and Iraq. That sounds more like a political cause than a religious cause. In addition, if you watch the videos that the, during, that the, the, the people put out, these groups put out, they're citing political reasons. They're saying, President Obama, you're now bombing Iraq. Here's you know, our res response. That they're not saying that I, as a Muslim, it's my sacred duty to kill random Western people. No. Think about how it's our, if, if we, if I, as a Muslim scholar and a professor, if I sit there and engage in a long apology about how Islam is a religion of peace and you know, Muslims are good people, and if I go on Fox News and, and do that, I'm actually furthering, I'm, 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 a, I'm kind of facilitating a sickness in this country, which is that people don't think about the consequences of their actions overseas. They don't think about the consequences that they have on the millions of people who lose their lives, on the millions of families that are destroyed. They don't think about them because they're not American, because they're not white.
Okay, and that's, that's ridiculous. I can't imagine anybody actually getting up and mounting a reasonable defense of that view of the world. And they don't think about the consequences it has for the hatred that this sows against Americans abroad. I'm not a courageous person. I'm a selfish person, I'll be honest. I don't want to be attacked. I don't want my family to be hurt. I don't want my city to be attacked. I would rather have the smallest number of possible people abroad who want to do me harm. And I do not understand why some people think it is in the best interest of American citizens to increase tenfold, hundredfold the number of people who want to do harm to Americans. I always remember this great Onion headline, if anyone ever reads the, the Onion, new bomb able to create a thousand new terrorists with a single blast. So educating people about Islam's stance towards violence against women, against the Sharia's real teachings, and then telling them about reminding them that violence against women is a global problem. It is a problem that's caused by men, okay? And men are everywhere. And until men take account of that as men, it's not going to be solved. You're just gonna have distraction by focusing on Muslims and allowing people to continue imagining that it's only Muslims who hate women or who oppress them. Thank you very much, Jazakum al khair. If I said anything wrong, please forgive me. I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions or, or hear comments if there's any time left. Yeah, sure, of course. So in, in the Sharia tradition, you don't have juries, right? Uh, juries is an interesting institution. I think it, it general, his, the general opinion of scholars is that the juries actually originally comes from, from the Vikings, from Denmark. And the, Dan, the, the Vikings ruled a uh, large part of, uh, of England called the Dane Law um, from the 800s onward for a few centuries. And that's uh, where the jury system comes from. Uh, it, it also appears um, elsewhere, actually similar to the Islamic tr Sharia tradition of what's called qas Qasama. So if, uh, if let's say somebody finds, there's like a, in my neighborhood, somebody finds someone who's killed, uh, like in my yard. So this would be you know, circumstantial evidence that I killed them, let's say. If I and 50 other people, if 50 other people in my neighborhood and my relatives and the friends swear an oath that I'm innocent, then I'm innocent. But depending on the, there's in the Hanafi school and the other schools, they, they, they invert the procedure. But basically, you have, it's kind of like character witnesses. It's a jury of your peers, literally of your community, that is willing to swear to your innocence. So uh, there's, you have the same tradition in, in Germany in the, the Middle Ages, in, from the 900s to the 1200s. And that also is probably linked to the jury system. Uh, obviously not all trials in the American system and the British system are jury trials. Oftentimes it's the judge. But when it comes to criminal trials, you'd have a jury. In the Sharia, it's the judge who passes, who's, who is convinced or not convinced uh, by, the, by the evidence and by the witnesses. So, uh, for example, like in the, in the Someone can go to prison, but they're actually innocent, as we hear on the news all the time. Someone's been released after five years. And under theoretical exact Sharia law, can something like that happen? Or? So uh, the 
another thing that's important to keep in mind is, is murder in general, the few exceptions. Murder is handled as uh, wrong against another person. So it's the family of the person, and if they don't have any family, it's the, the judge or, the, or the, the government that acts as the wali of the person. They bring the case to the court and they say, oh, we need, we need to be compensated for the wrongful death of our kinsman or, our, or this person. So it's, uh, and they can either take the compensation, they can forgive the person, or they can have the, pers the, the murderer executed. So it's, uh, it's not handled through prison. It's handled through either payment of money or... Can the person be accused of actually being uh, Yes, they, they could. You know, if, if, yeah, if, I mean, if the person, if you have reliable witnesses who testify that the per they saw the person killing the, per the victim, and if there's no evidence against them, or there's no evidence to exculpate them, then they may be innocent and they may still be uh, found guilty. In general, in, it's hard to say because Islamic civilization is a big area over a long period of time, but the tendency was that you don't have executions, you have just payments of blood money. Payments of the dia is usually how it's handled. Because uh, you don't, why does anyone want to have more death? Prison is usually not used as a punishment historically in Islamic civilization. Sometimes, for example, the Ottomans used prison, but oftentimes it was, uh, it was uh, lashing or having your feet bitten, uh, beaten by like a reed, very painful. That would have been the lesser levels of punishment. Um, yes? Um, here's in, the, in recent times, there's been a, some there have been a, some scholars um, that have justified state violence against state dissidents. Um, and does that actually affect? Uh, does it has, is that like a, is that a tradition? Is that something that has been affecting uh, the way people are acting now, for example, so outside of the state? In the there's one of the hadood crimes is called hiraba, or banditry, or you know, um, like lawlessness, you know, violent lawlessness. Uh, and in theory, the, ru the ruler or the judge is allowed to use violence against that, to fight those people, to, to take them, to try them, and to punish them. Um, now, that if you have a group of people in society who have a grievance, and they rebel against the state, they are usually termed bura. It's called, uh, uh, and in fact, it would be kisab al burat, the, the, the subject of, of rebels. Rebels have to have, they have to have a grievance. Like bandits, people who just murder people and rob, take their money, they don't have some grievance, they're just greedy. But if people say, for example, we had a elected president and he was in power and he was prevented from governing effectively because the security establishment of the old regime was refusing to follow orders, was actively undermining his rule, was, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And now the army has stepped in and is, uh, has removed this person from power and is g killing uh, civilians that group has a legitimate grievance. They would be considered burat. In the, even by, let's say, the, the, I think, responsible scholars, Muslim scholars looking at them. And with burat, as the Quran uh, tells us, if two parties from the Muslims fight, you have to try and reconcile them. You don't have an excuse, you don't have a license to wipe out one of the parties men, women, and children. You have to try and reconcile them. And if they return to the command of God, or you can reconcile them, or you can solve their grievance, or find some kind of compromise, they can't be punished. They're not, they receive essentially amnesty. So that's the proper Islamic uh, procedure. Not to say that these people are khawarij for rebelling against a legitimate ruler, 
which of course the government, the, the army also just did, and which thousands of these black bloc protesters have been doing for months and nothing happened to them. To call them Khawarij and say that they can be killed in public because they're filthy, disgusting people, as some, scholars, as some of my teachers uh, said, uh, that is not uh, responsible. I have no problem saying that. I don't have any qualms about that. I'm going to I'm going to get some of these written questions in. Some people are too shy to ask verbally. Dr. Brown opened up Pandora's box and all these questions are coming about mm -hmm. Hudud and stuff. So um, these are related one to the other. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. I love this question. But it, I don't know if the audience is going to Okay, one, uh, in, this day, in, in this day and age of technology, if one has a camera and records the, z the zina, what happens? This is interesting, I discussed it with my students. Sorry. We delayed Isha just a few minutes, so don't worry, we're not gonna uh, go into Isha, we're delaying it in the masjid, so when we say we're done, we're done, and then it will be time for Salah, so don't worry. So there, there's an important command, is repeat the question? The, in this day and time of technology, if one has a camera and records zina, what happens? Very interesting question. So, and this is related to what I said about DNA evidence. The command that Muslim judges have when it comes to the, what's called haquq Allah, the rights of God, which are the had crimes, the Prophet has told us, al hudud al mu'minin bishubahat. Ward off the Hudud crimes from the believers as much as you can. Ward off the Hudud punishments from the believers as much as you can. If you find a way out for somebody, let him go. Or let her go. For it is better for the judge to err in mercy than for the judge to err in severity. This is, a, this is a command from the Prophet of God, this is a command. This is not be merciful, this is a command that Muslim judges had to follow, and they took seriously. And if you read my new book, Misquoting Muhammad, which I recommend, which is a bit thicker than this one, I have great examples in that book of this happening historically in Islamic civilization. The uh, DNA, is not sufficient to prove somebody is guilty of zina. Because DNA evidence can be wrong. It can be tampered with, there can be mistakes in the lab, it can, people can be misidentified. And I, just, I think it was just two years ago, I remember on the radio, there was, an F, there was a crime lab in the DC area, an FBI crime lab, where one technician had been, I think it was intentionally, falsifying DNA results. And so like you have people getting off of crimes for DNA, because of DNA evidence, these people who had been convicted due to evidence that had passed through this clerk's hands or this technician's hands, they also had to be released. You know, and some of them had been, I think maybe one of them, I, th I don't think any of them had been executed, but they, had, they were released. So because there's a possibility of error, that's what's called shubha. That is an ambiguity. And there's a, one of the cases I, I use with my students in classes, in the 1960s there was a Saudi student in uh, Spain on vacation. And he was in a bar in Spain, he and his friends, and he came across a group of hibiyun, hippies. <laughs> you know what, hibiyun, okay? And they get in a fight, and uh, the police come, and the guys, apparently, he admits to the police in Spain that he had been drinking beer. So he was drunk. He gets shipped back to Saudi Arabia and he gets brought before the Qadi in Jeddah, the judge in Jeddah. He then says, I wasn't drinking alcohol, I was drinking beer. <laughs> what does he mean? Maybe he means he was drinking Odul's or, you know, uh, whatever this non-alcoholic non beer, right? That, that statement becomes sufficient shubha that he's not going to have the 80 lashes applied that you would have for drinking alcohol in intoxication. He's punished in other ways. You know, he's fined, or he's, I can't remember the exact punishments. Uh, but he had, a, he had a lesser punishment. So this is what happens. You have a lesser punishment applied, not the, not the head punishment. 
In the case of videotape, um, I have to use it. I'm sorry if this is too much, but there's a certain industry that is based on videotaping activities and then selling these videotapes. Everybody knows this industry? Okay, if you don't understand it, then you're either too protected, which is great, you don't have to worry about it, or you're not as smart as Tahir here, okay? <laughs> so there's a, you see these videotapes and it's pretty clear what's happening and if everybody knows what the requirements for a witness of this act are, those requirements are met, okay? Those requirements are met and a half. So, well, you always see the, uh, the act in the... So why aren't these... Why can't we go and arrest these actors for that crime? Because a videotape can be doctored. A videotape can be altered. A videotape can be, you know, feigned. Or f That's a shubha. But, and this is my own contribution to this discourse, these are films. There's people on the set who are witnessing this. There's, let's say, four men on the set who can be brought and asked, and if they tell the truth, would this not be a case of zina? No, this is my theory, because they have to be adil, they have to be shahid adil, they have to be an upstanding witness. And by definition, if that's your job, you are not <laughs> adil. And I know you're thinking, you know, Professor Brown is really pushing it here. He's really trying to find excuses. That's exactly what Muslim judges always did. They always looked for excuses. You can punish people through lots of ways. You can yell at them. You can embarrass them. You can parade them through the streets and have people insult them. You can lash them. You can imprison them. You can fine them. But you don't have to kill them. And God tells us, ward off the Hadood punishments by any means you can, by any ambiguity you can. So that's my answer to those questions. If they're not married, it's not a, it's not a by I mean, yeah, 100 lashes. If you can survive that, then more power to you. L last question, inshallah, we're going to break uh, for Salah. Uh, okay. Osama, 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 Osama in the front. Oh, okay. uh, so in the last couple of years, we're seeing around the world in the US an abuse of police forces and institutional racism being, you know, be, uh, police forces being a vehicle for institutional racism. How does Islam deal with that? How does Islam deal with a culture of policing in the Sharia? So the question is, the last few years you've seen a t pattern of abuse of police power uh, and institutional racism in the police and expressed through the violence of police power application. You know, that, that's a tough question because it, you know, nobody, in theory, nobody thinks that racism is good, okay? In theory, nobody thinks that abuse of police power is good. The dispute is whether or not racism is happening and whether or not police power is being abused. A lot, this, this, this phenomenon is a function, is a product of, the, mo of a modern, the modern states, okay? Modern states have the capacity, the technological capacity, to observe, to surveil, to surveil, to prosecute uh, a population over a vast area. Okay. Pre-modern states do not have this power. Okay, if you, a Muslim ruler or a British ruler, or someone, someone in the 1700s, they do not have the, whether you're in Europe or the Middle East, you do not have the manpower or the infrastructure to know what everybody's doing all the time, to handle every complaint that comes in, every case of theft, every... That's why for most Muslims throughout history, like most British people throughout history, problems were handled in your community. Even without even going to a qadi or a judge, just handled by local elders, would adjudicate disputes, problems between couples, accusations of theft, accusations of fraud. Uh, you don't have police power abuse is a product of powerful police forces, and that's a modern phenomenon, a very modern phenomenon. Uh, and I think that the answer to that question is the same answer to questions like whether or not the state has the right to listen in on our phone calls.
to record all our communications, to surveil us with drones or satellites or whatever? And I believe the answer to that is no, they don't have that right. And that means that you have to be willing to say, you know, I know that sometimes you're not going to be able to find the bad guy, but it's more important that my rights to privacy, my rights to movement, to freedom of association, my right to freedom of speech, that's more important than the fact that sometimes, yeah, I'm going to be in danger. Sometimes you're not going to be able to find the bad guy. And as I, as I hope you will have understood through what I've said, the Islamic legal tradition is, when it comes to certainly the rights of God, always prefers to have the innocent go, f the, the guilty go free accidentally than have the innocent prosecuted or punished accidentally. I think that's a good weight, way to weight the equation. And I think that if you fall into this idea that just keep me safe, I'm so scared. Now it's the Khorasan group who wants to attack us. Now it's this group that wants to attack us. Now it's that group. Please, government, just keep me safe. Take away all my rights. It's all right. That's a very bad way to live. And that's exactly the excuse that uh, states need to increase their power unchecked. Uh, Dr. Brown, uh, Allah, beautiful uh, thought. Thank you.